But the good news is that we saw in Ezra chapter 10 that we can still say like Shechaniah, but in spite of this, there is still hope for Israel. I must say that according to the promises of Scripture, there's still hope for America. And all God's people said, all faithful Americans said, we cannot stop believing that there's hope for America. In 2 Chronicles 7.14, God gives the promise that we're all familiar with. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. We hear that verse quoted all the time. And we talk about it with prayer and confession and fasting and all those sort of things. But it's a promise that there's still hope for America. So in this 10-year period between Ezra and Nehemiah, Israel had fallen again into failure. They had again turned to confession and fasting. And they again committed themselves to faithfulness. Because they recognized the promises of God. In Ezra chapter 10, let's go back and read that again. Ezra chapter 10 verse 2. Then Shechaniah, son of Jehiel, one of the descendants of Elam, said to Ezra, We have been unfaithful to our God by marrying foreign women from the peoples around us. But in spite of this, there is still hope for Israel. Verse 3. Now let us make a covenant before our God to send away all these women and their children in accordance with the counsel of my Lord and of those who fear the commands of our God. Let it be done according to the law. Rise up. This matter is in your hands. We will support you, so take courage and do it. So Ezra rose up and he put the leading priests and Levites and all Israel under oath to do what had been suggested, and they took the oath. I love it when they say, it is your task, we are with you, we will support you. Ezra, whatever it is that God is telling you to do, we are in favor of that. Take courage and do it. In the time of Nehemiah, they do something very similar. Nehemiah is coming back to Jerusalem to rebuild the walls, a task that is accomplished in 52 days. In Nehemiah chapter 10, it says this way, the rest of the people, priests, Levites, gatekeepers, singers, Temple servants and all who separated themselves from the neighboring peoples for the sake of the law of God, together with their wives and all their sons and daughters who were able to understand. Look at verse 29. All these now join their brothers, the nobles, and bind themselves with a curse and an oath to follow the law of God, given through Moses the servant of God, and to obey carefully all the commands, regulations, and decrees of the Lord, of the Lord our God. We promise not to give our daughters in marriage to the peoples around us or take their daughters for our sons. Almost identical words to Ezra that was 10 years earlier. There's still hope for America, but it's not in politics or economics or war or whatever. It's only in our confession and repentance and intercession before God for ourselves and our country. We've taken a little bit of time today to reflect on the events of 10 years ago. And it's the same way in our prayer life. We need to take time to reflect and remember where our relationship and our faithfulness to God has faltered. We have changed, but God hasn't. And that's a source of unending hope for the Christian. And I want to read you a couple passages in Scripture that as we approach this time of confession and repentance, we should encourage you. In Isaiah chapter 44, it says this, Remember these things, O Jacob, for you are my servant, O Israel. I have made you, you are my servant, O Israel. I will not forget you. I have swept away your offenses like a cloud, your sins like the morning mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. Sing for joy, O heavens, for the Lord has done this. Shout aloud, O earth beneath. Burst into song, you mountains, you forests, and all your trees. For the Lord has redeemed Jacob. He displays his glory in Israel. And all God's people said, God will not forget you. He is still able to redeem. In Psalm 103, it says it this way, The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. 
God has not changed. And we can talk about the many things that have happened in the last 10 years in so many different ways. And we can think of the thoughts of, of that day that we, we remember and how our hearts were turned to, towards God. And where is He in all of this suffering? And you see the picture behind me is called the 9-11 cross. Uh, it was found uh, in the, the mass of rubble that day. And of course, anytime we can latch on to something, we will. It's, to me, it's not that much of a surprise that they found an I-beam that's still connected and in the shape of a cross. Um, but nevertheless, it became a symbol of hope for America, for those who even had notions about God, would point to that cross and say, look, God was in the midst of that rubble and in that mess. And they would either find reasons to blame him or reasons to seek him. And I think that cross has made a world tour, or at least a tour of the United States, and I'm not sure where it is now. Uh, and maybe you've, you've seen the picture, when it was in the video, one of my favorite pictures of, uh, I think it's four or five firemen carrying out an elderly man uh, who, who died. He was a chaplain of the fire department. That's just, that's just one of my favorite pictures, personally, because I'm a, I'm a pastor, but you all have an image in your mind that you remember of that day. Whether it's a video or uh, something afterwards, but you saw uh, the, a couple of pictures in the video of people just not knowing what was going on. And just this, when their world fell apart, where did they turn? When your world falls apart, God is the only place you can turn because he's the only constant, the only unchanging source of hope. The only thing that's reliable. Before they had a chaplain in Congress, the congressmen used to take turns opening the sessions with prayer. And then finally they got a permanent chaplain, and that was his job. But one day he was late in arriving for the session. And when time came for the session to begin, he wasn't there to pray. And then one of the older congressmen stepped to the front and prepared to pray. And the Speaker of the House hit the desk with his gavel and said, By what right does the gentleman pray? The volunteer answered the Speaker, The right of any sinner, sir. He was permitted to pray. Any of us have that right. The right of any sinner to go to God and confess and repent. And as we close this morning, it's going to be an extended time of closing. We're going to sing. We're going to read some scripture. I'm going to read some prayers to you. Um, I, I know that some of this will be unfamiliar and uncomfortable to you. You don't have to do anything. I just want you to allow God to do what He wants to do in, your, in you. Whether you sing, whether you pray, whether you come to the altar, they're open, that's up to you. But some of the things in some of the prayers, you're going to go, well, that's very self-loathing or self-despising. But, um, the reason that you may think that is because we're so unfamiliar with how holy our God is and how sinful we are. So I don't want it to be disturbing to you because these are not prayers that I wrote. These are prayers that have been recorded through history. Times of confession and repentance, not just in the church, but uh, during great revivals and around the world in times of great need. And last week we closed with the verse, and I want to close with it again this week. We talked about confidence of approaching the throne of grace with confidence in prayer. But this week, I want to emphasize that as you approach with the throne of grace with confidence, that you receive mercy. It says, let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Why do we go with confidence? To find mercy and grace. I want to begin with a a prayer of repentance, and in a, in a minute or so, Al is going to come and read a passage from Psalms 51. As we begin this time, let me just again say, you may come to the altar, you may sit where you are, um, you may sing, you may not sing, uh, but I do ask that you, whatever it takes for you to restore communion with God, do that at this time. Whatever you need to confess, repent of, so let's begin with this. Oh, Father, we are gathered before you, the maker of heaven and earth, whose chosen dwelling place is with the broken and contrite. 
to confess that we have sinned in thought, in word, and deed. We have not loved you with all our heart and soul. We have not loved you with all our mind and strength. We have not even loved our neighbor as ourselves. In your mercy, deepen our sorrow for the wrong we have done and for the good we have left undone, so that we may hate our sin with a holy hatred. But please, Father, do not leave us in sorrow. With you, O Lord, there is forgiveness. In your mercy, restore the joy of our salvation, so that we may love you with a holy love. This statement is completely reliable and should be universally accepted. Christ Jesus entered the world to rescue sinners. He personally bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might be dead to sin and be alive to all that is good. God's mercy never ends. I tell you, in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. We don't have to stay in a place of mourning or confession or repentance where we can have full faith and confidence that our sins are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. And all God's people said, let's close with this, incomprehensible, this is called new beginning. Incomprehensible, great and glorious God, I adore thee and abase myself. I approach thee mindful that I am less than nothing, a creature worse than nothing. My thoughts are not screened from thy gaze. My secret sins blaze in the light of thy countenance. Enable me to remember that blood which cleanseth all sin, to believe in that grace which subdues all iniquities, to resign myself to that agency which can deliver me from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the sons of God. Thou hast begun a good work in me, and canst alone continue and complete it. Give me an increasing conviction of my tendency to err and of my exposure to sin. Help me to feel more of the purifying, softening influence of religion, its compassion, love, pity, courtesy, and employ me as thy instrument in blessing others. Give me to distinguish between the mere form of godliness and its power between life and a name to live, between guile and truth, between hypocrisy and religion that will bear thy eye. If I am not right, set me right, keep me right, and may I at last come to thy house in peace. And all God's people said, Amen and Amen, you are dismissed.